Hello. Good morning. Uh, thanks for braving the snow and some of the weather. Hopefully it wasn't, wasn't that much of, of snow. Today is Super Bowl Sunday. Um, so I wore my football jersey. Now, we'll get a couple things out of the way right now. Yes, I'm a Panther fan. And yes, I realize the Panthers aren't playing in the Super Bowl as is most of your teams before you uh, let me hear about that. <laughs> Uh, I do n- have not seen a lot of Bengals or uh, Rams uh, jerseys or hats or paraphernalia around here in the coming in the previous football season. But yes, uh, since today is Super Bowl Sunday, I have a little bit of a Super Bowl story. Um, but I know another but. Uh, yeah, a lot of these. I know that a lot of the women, and not all, not all, don't jump on me, but a lot of the women aren't going to really relate to a football story right now. So just to know that I'm thinking of both sides here, um, I brought in New Hope's very own football translator, Jody Ash, uh, to help translate this story for the women. Yes, yes. (sighs) It was Super Bowl 38. I don't know if any of you can remember that. The Patriots... Uh, that we got a little picture. Uh, the Patriots were in their second Super Bowl with the Belichick and Brady combo. The Carolina Panthers were in their franchise's first Super Bowl. It surprised most of the football nation that they were even there. They had been nicknamed the Cardiac Cats that year for winning seven games by three points or less, and they had five games, five games that went into overtime, including a d- NFC divisional game on the road against the Rams that went to double overtime and was ended by the too short to be a receiver Steve Smith catching a pass from Jake DeLome for t- 60, and Jake DeLome was the second string quarterback that year going for 69 yards. What a team full of misfits, right? And now for this week's episode of Super Bowl, our cute, funny, outgoing Winnie the girl every guy wants to date, is in a new relationship with Carl. No one's quite sure how Carl got together with Winnie. He's not really that good looking, and he's kind of socially awkward. But they seem happy, and Winnie thinks she might even be falling in love. Dun, dun, dun. Her previous love interest has moved back to town. Pat calls her up on the phone to see if they can get together. Carl or Pat? What's a girl to do? (laughs) The game is still regarded as one of the greatest Super Bowls. Not the greatest, don't get on me, but it's still like if you go up and look some of the best Super Bowls, it still makes top five, top ten lists, depending on who's writing about it. Because no points were scored in the first and third quarters, thanks to Julius Peppers, and still holds the record for the longest offensive play in Super Bowl history. Jake DeLome connects with Moose and Muhammad for an 85-yard touchdown. I have a video clip of it, but we're going to cut back on time and not show that right now. Through a lot of crazy plays, I'm going to catch you up to speed. We're sitting at 29-22, Patriots on top. The, the Panthers have just got an interception to give them the ball, and they have two minutes and 51 seconds left in the game. It's not looking good, but these are the cardiac cats. Winnie agrees to meet with Pat at the local coffee shop, and as they catch up, she realizes there's still a spark. Maybe she should break up with Carl and give Pat another chance, but... What would happen to Carl? The Panthers score and leave 108 on the clock. All the momentum is theirs. It looks like this will be the first Super Bowl to go to an overtime. Uh, The momentum is all the Panthers right now. I remember this game so vividly. Uh, It was just a really exciting time. Uh, Kind of up until this point, I hadn't got to watch maybe a lot of professional football, but this season... The, uh, I was at college, and the games were all on, like, our, our, our TV there at the college, and so I got to watch games leading up until this. Again, Panthers weren't really shown around here very much, but I got to watch some of the games and definitely keep up with them on my fantasy football and stuff that year. And I remember the announcers talking, and it was like, dude, Panthers are rolling right now. This, this goes into overtime. It's really looking good for the Panthers. It was just so much excitement. I remember all the Panthers high-fiving everybody. A minute 08. But then, it was, it was really in their favor. 
Carl senses something's changed with Winnie. He is determined to win the girl, so he knows it's going to take a big, bold move to win her heart, even if it is a long shot. So he chooses the perfect spot with a breathtakingly beautiful view, and he decides to propose right at sunset. Will Winnie say yes? With the defense they have, all they need to do is place the kick deep and hold them. John Casey, their kicker, has been their reliable kicker since the team was formed in 1995, an original Panther. With 79 kickoffs that season alone, all kept in bounds, his 80th kick, this one, goes out of bounds and gives Tom Brady and the Pats the ball on the 40-yard line. They only need like 30 yards to get into like Adam Vinatieri's kick to reach to be able to kick this which they do, and Adam kicks the game winner. And now, for the exciting conclusion to Super Bola. Carl is down on one knee, proposing. Winnie's heart beats wildly. Is this really happening? When suddenly, Carl's best friend John runs in to take a photo, but he trips on a rock and knocks the ring out of Carl's hand and it rolls toward the edge. No! It goes over the edge with a plink, 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 plink. Something catches Winnie's eye and she sees oh, Pat is running toward her, seemingly in slow motion. He comes, gets down on one knee and says, I love you. I've always loved you. Marry me. She takes one last look at Carl, runs into Pat's arms and says, yes, I'll marry you. And they lived happily, at least for the next 15 years. I know. Uh, a lot of us in seriousness now, thanks for humoring this story, but I know a lot of us in this room, and I say us because I, myself included, but I've heard a lot of the stories in here. A lot of us relate to a John Casey. A lot of us relate to somebody who we feel like we've messed up. Maybe even that our lives were defined by one mistake rather than all the other stuff that we did. That we made a bad choice, we let somebody down, we hurt other people around us, we've messed up. And before you run for the door, because, because you don't know if you can take one more church service where everybody's beating on you and like, yes, yes, I get it, I, I messed up, the service isn't going to be like that. What you're going to find today is something a little different. And if you feel like maybe you've never really messed up, and that you wish maybe all these people that I keep on referring to, these sinners that seem to be all over in this church, uh, would just leave so maybe you could have this church to yourself, you might be in the wrong family, okay? The wrong church family. Speaking of church families, we're going to have um, some family time this morning. I'm going to ask us to get together in little groups. This might be a perfect time for your family just to get together in a group, your parents maybe to lead this. We did this last month. It worked out really well. Had a lot of people uh, say this, this was really good for them. However, I understand, and I just want to acknowledge, there are some of you that you, maybe you're new today or you're an introvert, and what I have just said is code red. You're looking at the exit doors and, and bright exit lines. How do I get out of the sanctuary any faster? I can make a beeline if I head out right now. I'm giving you a free pass, free pass. It breaks our heart a little bit, but it's okay to say, hey, no, no thanks, or just you know, shield your eyes, or put your bulletin over your eyes, or something like that. It's okay, we, 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 we're gonna miss the, the chance to be able to get to know you and interact with you, but it's all right. You have a free pass from Dave, from the stage. It's okay. Um, we're gonna get together, and it's just really important to be known by your church family, and, and, and your church family know you. It's, it's a good chance to be able to connect. So we're gonna be able to, we're gonna form some groups this morning and, and have some chances where you're gonna read the scriptures, where you're gonna talk about them um, today, including doubt in chapel. Hello, everybody in the chapel. So if you could get into groups of four or six, the smaller the better right now, but if you need to even get a couple families together, that's great. Right now, and I would like you to, if you need to, a chance to introduce yourselves, but then read this scripture and talk about this question if you need a question to talk about. Go. You don't have to rearrange chairs or anything. Just grab a few people around you.
Okay. Yes.
I forgot a couple little things. I uh, should have let you know. Sorry, my bad. Um, there are some Bibles, even some extra Bibles over at the patio. So if you didn't have a Bible there, we are going to do this a couple more times. So if you need a Bible at the next break, go ahead and grab a Bible. You can keep it. They're free. Go for it. Um, if you also need to, if you're like, I don't want to go on over there, I don't mind. I did put a QR code, which just means you take your camera and you open up your, your if you have a smartphone, put up your camera, just your normal camera, up to it. It'll bring up a link, and I have all the scriptures there that we'll be using printed there uh, on an online web page. So uh, you can use smart technology or grab a Bible over there either way. Kids, fifth grade and under, sorry colliders, I love you, but fifth grade and under, if you want to, um, you can draw me a picture of that story or a time you were forgiven for something or you forgave somebody for something. And I want, I want to see in that picture, I want to see what, for sure what was forgiven but I'll give out some, I'll, I'll open up the pop machine and give out some uh, pop after the service to anybody who gives me, to their parents. Pop to the parents, that the parents can distribute that. When, you, when parents, you feel like they, they, they can, but uh, you, you get um, some pop from me afterwards if you want to turn in a picture. Sorry, fifth grade and under, and no, I'm a fifth grader in my heart. I've heard that before. So first off, in order to understand this story and this whole series that Carrie has been talking about when David got on up and he talked about the announcements, you know, he even referenced this whole series that Carrie has been doing and talking about disciples and he talked about rooted. Um, to understand that, I think we need to understand, first off, we need to understand one thing is that when I talk about a disciple, I'm not talking about one of the 12 disciples in the Bible that followed Jesus. I'm not talking about one of the hundreds of disciples that followed Jesus as we read, the, read in the Bible. I'm talking about anyone who says Jesus is their Lord, who follows Jesus, who says Jesus is my Lord and Savior, then you are a disciple. Anyone who ever has, anyone who ever will you are a disciple. A disciple is someone who says, I follow Jesus. Okay, so don't get a free pass when I use the word disciple saying, oh, he's talking about somebody else. He's talking about somebody in the Bible. No, that includes most of you in this room, many of you in this room. The second thing you need to understand here is that Jesus loved forgiving sins. Here is a prime opportunity to throw back life in the face of this woman, and he doesn't. He could say something like, so how's that lifestyle working out for you? Or, dang, you did mess up, huh? Or I bet, I bet you wish you'd know now you'd made a better decision then. But no, he simply forgives sins. And this is not the only time that he does this. He does this over and over and over. I don't want you to get the misconception that just because we read one story from Luke's account, there are several times in Luke that it record, Luke records Jesus forgiving sins. He loves doing this. Now, for a little analogy, try to imagine this with me. Put on your imagination caps. Let's imagine, let's pretend that you're on a cruise ship. Okay, you're on a nice big cruise ship. For some entertainment, you decide uh, they're doing fishing out of the cruise ship. So this isn't like you're going off on another boat. You get to go fishing, Crocodile Dundee style, Crocodile Dundee style out of the cruise ship because you find some way to get a hold of this. You think it's going to be a blast, okay? But fishing's really bad, so you do it a lot. Now, some people might point out how bad of an idea this is. I'm copying Jesus, so I'm not going to do that right now. <laughs> but, however, this choice has led to some pipes bursting and cracks in the boat's hole. You are taking on water. Not super fast, but fast enough that you are sinking. This ship is sinking. Now, I'm going to kind of cartoonize two different people that would react to this situation. I know there's a lot of in-between, and really these two extremes would really fall more into the, but I'm going to extremize them for us. There are two people that might be on this boat that this might have happened to, that might have ha taken a different approach to it. One person might not have even have checked on anything. They don't think the boat's sinking. They think this was harmless fun. They think, you know, oh, everybody had a good time. Everything's really, it's, it's okay here. Nobody got hurt. Everyone had, has a, now a story they're going to tell about they fished Crocodile Dunstee style or saw somebody doing, the boat's not really sinking. Denial's not just a river that runs in Egypt. 
Like the Pharisee, this person is like the Pharisee in our story, or the person um, in Jesus' story that was forgiven for the lesser amount, the story that Jesus tells. But there's, a, there's another person in this, a second person, and they know the boat is sinking. They know they've messed up. They know it, and they feel horrible. There's nothing they can do. Maybe they go up to the bar for one last drink as a stoic captain um, going down with their ship. And they know they've messed up. But they don't think that I know or somebody else knows how much they've messed up. They don't think that I know that their boat is sinking. Dave, you have no idea what I've done. You have no idea where I've gone. The things I've said, the people I've hurt, they think their mess up is too big to be forgiven. I'd like you to get into your groups again and read John chapter 1. Again, scriptures, Bible's over there, Bible's over here. You have like three minutes, so there you go. Oh, it says John, Luke 1. Sorry, it is John 1. John 1. Sorry. John 1. Thank you. Who's this John? Who's this John that was talking? John the Baptist. What does that make him to Jesus? His cousin. Do you realize how crazy this is? This John is Jesus' cousin, yet John says, this man, this, my cousin, is the Lamb of God, the Son of God. 
John is like, and I'm putting this in my own words here, but he's like, you know, Jesus, your mom's my aunt, but yeah, I believe you're the son of God. <laughs> and then he says that this man, his cousin, takes away some of the, the, the lesser sins of the world, world. Now, if you look up the word lesser sins in Greek, uh, maybe it it's like refers to like level three to one sins, uh, but not level four and definitely fives right out. So, um, I mean, he has to draw the line somewhere, right? Now, how amazing and generous of a, of a God to forgive level sin, three sins and below. I don't know how long you guys are going to let me keep going with that. Uh, this is false teaching what I'm doing right now, and somebody should maybe ca call me out on misreading scripture and definitely mispreaching it. Uh, I, you guys are, have the right to call out anybody if they're mis mispreaching preaching God's word on stage. I, I was hoping maybe even a collider would call me out because I do that to them all the time to see who's listening. But I do misread this passage for a reason, not just to see who's paying attention and who will call out false teaching on, on stage. But I do it for another reason, to point out how ridiculous of an idea this is that Jesus forgives some sins but not other sins. Or even a second idea that there is a hierarchy of sins, that some sins are worse than other sins. It does not say this. It does not, in, in, I, I hate to be the one, I'm sorry to be the one to tell you, in your sin, but you're not that special. You're not that special. What do I mean by that? It's not like God, in all his mighty wisdom, power, and omnipresence, came to you, or, or even me for that matter, and was stumped. It's not like he came to you or me and was like, oh, you know, okay, I should have had John write that a little bit different. I should have said, okay, I should have John made a change and said, well, Jesus came to take away the sins of the world minus Dave, right? It's not like he came to your sins and was stumped. It's not like he's like, oh my gosh, I've never seen sin like this. It's not like this at all. If there was a grading system, which there is not, it's, it for sure as heck wouldn't beat the man after God's own heart, a title given to a king of Israel who slept with a guy's wife and then had him murdered to, to cover it up. That guy was forgiven. You're forgiven, no matter whether you've done something worse than that or better than that, and it doesn't matter because there is no worse or better. It's not about comparing because God looks at our hearts. We, and this is going to get a little worse, and then it's going to get a little better, but I'm sorry to say we're all that king. We have all made bad choices, and bad choices are bad choices. There's no hierarchy, which means sins are sins. Now, let's come back to the boat here. So you may be somebody, you know, that thinks your sin's not that bad. Basically, you're a good person. And that's pretty much what Simon was thinking in, in this story. Now, one, notice one of these people in the story, the first story that we read about, one of those people went home forgiven and in total love of God. And that person was not the person that everybody looked at in that room and says, that person has their life together. That person was not the person everybody looked at in that room and says, I want to be that person. The other person went home forgiven. The least likely, and according to everybody else, not according to Jesus and God, the le least likely person in that room to receive Jesus' forgiveness, got it right away and went home forgiven. If you're trying to grade sins and put them in some hierarchy, not so bad, the horrible decisions, then you're wrong. Jesus himself says in Matthew chapter 5 that if you're angry at somebody, it's the same as murder. So yes, I am sorry to say that all our sins are on the same level. But it doesn't end there. Like I said, it's going to get worse and then it's going to get better. Notice that it says that Jesus, in the passage we just read, John, not Luke, John, that Jesus 
He, does not, he, he took on the sins of the world, not condemns the world. Jesus had every right to condemn the world. He had every right. He could have said, you know, I've led a perfect life. You guys should get your acts together. But instead of pointing out our mistakes and our bad choices, he treats us the same way that he treats that woman. He takes our sins upon himself so that when God looks at us, he sees the purity, the righteousness, the holiness of Jesus, not Dave's messed up past, not your messed up past. He doesn't see it. You follow Jesus, you believe in Jesus as a son of God, he doesn't see, you take him as your Lord and Savior, he doesn't see your messed up past. <laughs> That's great, right? Don't believe me? Let's look at Colossians chapter 2. I, we're not going to read this one in our groups. So I'm going to read it from up here. Colossians chapter 2. I'll give you a little time. You can turn there if you want or open up the, it's on the document. I think I do have it on the screens. Chapter 2, verse 13. I love hearing pages turn. That's awesome. Verse 13, And when you were dead in trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive with him and forgave us all our trespasses. He erased the certificate of debt with its obligations that was against us and opposed to us and has taken it away by nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and disgraced them publicly. He triumphed over them in him. I love this whole passage, especially the verses before it. You should go and read them, talking about baptism. It's lovely. But here Paul says, he says it wonderfully, that our choices following evil desires had consequences, but Christ forgave all our sins, canceling the charges against us, and he took them away, nailed them to the cross. We have a cross over here. To nail them to the cross where he has the power over our sins, they can no longer, your sins, your bad choices, your past, which we all have, some of us think it's too big of a deal to even forgive ourselves in this. We're going to talk more about that in just a sec. Like, yeah, it's great, Jesus forgives me, but I don't know if I can forgive myself. But they no longer have a hold on you. Jesus has taken them and nailed them to the cross, and when God sees you, he does not see your past. He does not see your bad choices. He sees his son, Jesus. Somebody's getting the better end of this deal. Jesus has taken them away. They can no longer lay claim to your life. They can no longer hurt you. Over and over again as you read Matthew and Mark and Luke and John, their accounts of Jesus' life, you see Jesus forgiving people, not speaking harshly to them. Okay, that's not entirely true. He speaks harshly a lot. But if you notice who he speaks harshly to, it's to, and this is really eye-opener, it's to the people that think they have their life together. And a majority of those people are religious leaders, basically the pastors, basically the me's. He speaks harshly to them, all kinds. Because they, they're like, they're basically the person in the boat that's like, you know what, this, this boat's, I haven't done anything that bad. This boat's not really sinking. These people thought they were pretty good on their own. I'm not like that person. I'm better than that person. They've created in their mind, whether they'd say it or not, a hierarchy of sins, and they haven't, they haven't done level three or four or five sins. It's not that way. If you were somebody that's like that, I might be a little bit worried, but not if you, were in the, if you were in the boat and you knew you messed up. You know your boat is sinking and you know you need help. If we're Christians, are we the sons and daughters of the Lord of forgiveness or the Lord of condemnation? The Lord that says you're guilty and you're guilty and you're guilty and you're guilty. Or are we the Lord that says you're forgiven, you're forgiven, you're the forgiven. Are we the sons and daughters of that Lord? I don't know if you can relate to one of the two people. Again, I kind of extremized them. That was handling, um, I, I think if we were to come back to those people and we would look at if we introduced another person in this boat that was handing out free life vests. Imagine how different, I know I've come back to this analogy a lot, but 
Imagine how different those two people would react to somebody giving out free life vests. The person that knows they messed up and they just feel kind of horrible about it and they don't know what to do, they're super excited. Free life vests. Somebody's come and they've taken away my bad choice. They've negated that. There is help. They would go run around saying, hey, there, this guy on the boat, he's giving away free life vests. You should go get a free life vest. This boat is sinking. You should go get a free life vest. Now imagine the other person. The other person's like, I don't need a life vest. It's going to get in the way of my shuffleboard game. You know, I can't be eating all kinds of buffet food while I got this big old life preserver on my neck. You know, sunbathing, I can't have that kind of a tan line going around me wearing this stupid old life preserver. How am I supposed to be getting it on on the dance floor with this big old life preserver on my neck? Jesus is not condemning you for, and I can't stress this strongly enough, whatever whatever you have done he is not condemning you for it instead he offers you a life vest he offers you free forgiveness are you excited about that are you somebody on this boat that's like free life vest yes thank you so much or are you somebody that's on this boat and you're like now nah, that's just going to get in the way it's just going to get in the way of my game the hardest person, and I understand this so much. I, this last week, actually, I, had to, I did this exercise where I was forgiving myself. And I had to read some of, I just read over some of my bad past choices. I did it in front of a mirror. This is awkward to even talk about, and it was awkward then too. But just trying to like, forgive myself. So I get it. Sometimes it's like, okay, Dave, I understand this. The hardest person to forgive is myself. Don't hold yourself accountable and over something for something Jesus has already forgiven. Don't negate what Jesus has done. Live in the joy that Jesus is offering you a free life vest. You don't have to hold yourself for something that God is not holding yourself to. John Casey had that kick really loom over him. You can read Panther stuff where people are still upset about this kick. If he just would have placed it down the field, we could have won. But thankfully, he's a strong Christian who works at an, as the athletic director for a Christian school in Charlotte. Um, they have had several athletes come through there, like a certain Steph Curry, but, you know, I don't know. Maybe, maybe you don't know. Uh, <laughs> um, he says football in no way shapes who he is. God does that. God shapes who he is. He's a Christian first. However, he was, you know, eventually let go. You know, that happens all the time. But as a sign of how well-loved and forgiven he was, the Panthers did an uncharacteristic thing when he retired. They signed him on a one-day contract so that he could retire a Panther. No one has worn his jersey since. And they had a whole list of people that played with him on that team and on all his other teams. Come on up and talk about how great of a guy this guy is, how, how wonderful it was to be able to play football with this guy. You are forgiven. I can't say it enough. In your groups, and we're, we're, we're going to be done here. Um, after the second service, there is uh, Get to Know New Hope. It'll be down there if you want a free lunch and, and get to know some more about New Hope and what they are. I'd love to see you down there. But it's so an open ending. Uh, we do have another service at 1030, and there are some children's classes. But families, if you take this conversation and you want to keep rolling with it as a family, just stay here and keep talking. <laughs> like, that is very okay. But we're just going to, there's no official end um, we're just going to read this passage, talk about it in your groups, and you're free to go whenever you want. If you need to go, if you have somewhere to go, that's great. You can get on out of here. But here's a chance for you to have some more conversation in your groups. Okay? Thank you so very much.